Dr. Timothy K. Pertola received his doctorate in anthropology from the University of Washington in 1989. Working primarily in East Texas, his research interests include Caddo Native history, community organization and development, and the study of the style and technology of ancestral Caddo ceramic traditions. Dr. Pertola has authored, co-authored, and edited numerous scholarly articles and books, including his most recent publication, Ancestral Caddo Ceramic Traditions. I want to personally thank Dr. Pertola for his willingness to participate in Texas Archaeology Month. And on that note, the floor is yours, Tim. Thank you, Drew. I'm glad to present uh, this paper on basically the artistry and craftsmanship of Caddo ceramic traditions in East Texas. I will be covering the area from the Red River on the north to deep East Texas, the area around Nac uh, Nacogdoches to the south. We're talking about the Caddo people who we know have lived in East Texas for at least 3,000 years, maybe longer. All that time they were making pottery and beginning from very simple plain, plain bowls and jars to very elaborate engraved pottery. And I'll take you through the, the timeline on all that, starting first on the Red River. Unfortunately, most of the pottery that we can study is in the hands of collectors. Here's an example of an early 20th century collector, George Wright, who lived on the Red River on a big Caddo Mound Center, and he was very active in digging and purchasing collections. Luckily for us, these vessels have been donated to the Sam Noble Museum of Natural History, where they have been and can be documented. There's plenty of examples in East Texas where that is not the case. Starting with woodland pottery, here's an example of what we see along uh, the Sulphur River, a simple barrel shaped jar, very thick walls tempered with grog, which is nothing more than just crushed pottery sherds. It's called Coles Creek incised, not because of any decoration you can see, but on the very thick lip itself, it has two incised lines. And this is characteristic Lower Mississippi Valley type pottery that was either traded or exchanged into East Texas many years ago. Other examples of woodland pottery. On the left, we have, uh, you can see what's called rocker stamping where they use a stamp and then uh, drew a long broad, deep incised line around it. This is Marksville incised, another lower Mississippi Valley type of pottery. The uh, sherds to the right are from a local context uh, with decorations. And most of woodland decorated pottery comes in about the same time as arrow points, about AD 700 or so. Um, and you can see uh, punctations of various sorts, uh, some rocker stamping down in the bottom uh, right, and combinations of incised uh, zones filled with punctations. This is all very characteristic, as you'll see with the earliest, what we consider ancestral Caddo pottery that starts to be made about AD 900. You can see here again, the very simple shapes of most of these vessels, barrel shaped and conical jars and bowls, some of which are decorated with uh, pretty fancy incised and engraved lines or incised lines with punctations, which are just simply a tool, probably a wood doll that's pushed into the pot while uh, it's still wet and has not been fired. Uh, example of the latter would be the Pennington punctated incised bowl on the left that has triangles drawn with incised lines filled with punctations. On the right, some of the fanciest caddo pottery ever made, holly fine engraved, very delicate 
very fine lines, very thin vessels, two to three millimeters. And they have a scroll element that wraps around each other and meets at a excised circle that you can see in the middle. And it's been enhanced by rubbing a hematite rich clay pigment into the lines. These all begin to be made about AD 900 to 1200. Another example of incised punctated pottery here where there are triangles, but are also circles filled with punctations. And most of those are made with a cane, uh, a river cane that was cut. Uh, these folks also with this kind of pottery and with the fine wear, uh, like triangles filled with curved linear lines. And this is a motif that you'll see all the way through cattle pottery. Um, on the Red River coming after 1200, we have what's called the Middle Caddo period. And this is distinguished by the very common use of a red slip. Again, a hematite rich clay slip is put on the vessel before it's fired and then engraved at the top or had uh, applique elements. I think you can see on this incredibly unique bottle, which I believe there's only two known but it has a little applique nodes. Sometimes they just had bottles that had a red slip and nothing else. The common cooking jar for these folks is called Canton and Sized. Uh, again, there are the triangles that they like uh, outlined by diagonal opposed lines. Uh, this has been reconstructed, but you can see areas of darker soil, I mean, darker color on the pot, that's probably because of being in the fire, getting residue on it. Next, we can move to the, what's called the late cattle period in the Western Red River area, dating from approximately 1400 to 1680. And here we have a very good record of different and distinct cattle groups, which we have named phases. And you can see the the distributions. Uh, the Titus phase mainly will extend well into East Texas, and we'll get into that later. But let me talk about the McCurtain phase, fine wares. These folks uh, also like to use red slip on their pottery. Uh, they commonly used what are called sun symbols or semicircles with uh, excised pendant triangles that are thought to be a rays of the sun. They also liked uh, the triangles, which you can see in the middle. And then at the bottom, we have a very distinctive carinated bowl shape that has a very simple uh, horizontal and vertical lines. Uh, the horizontal lines have little tick marks, which is very characteristic of this period. The cooking jars look uh, quite a bit different than Middle Caddo period. The vessel on the right is called Nash Neck Banded, and those are coils of clay that they uh, crimped between their fingers. It's very similar to pottery in the Southwest. That's called uh, corrugated pottery, and the ultimate derivation of this pottery may come from there, I don't know. To the left, we have a punctated rim vessel that has distinctive rim peaks and loop handles on it. And then the body has applique coil or applique elements where they take a coil of pottery and press it down on the body. Uh, in certain, direction, in certain directions and for certain decorations, almost always divided by a vertical ridge into four different repeating elements. Another plain wear vessel from the McCurtain phase, red slipped because of the distinctive very short rim, which matches the Sims engraved. Some people have dubbed this Sims plain. Moving farther downstream into the Texarkana area, 
but the most common engraved fine ware is this kind of carinated bowl with rectangular motifs, but also with that ticking you see. But these are scrolls that extend horizontally, horizontally and vertically across the panel divided by columns. And this is a Barkman engraved named after the Barkman site. Another fine ware, the very distinctive shaped bottle with scroll lines, the hooked arm elements, but do not meet and a spool neck at the top, which we believe probably had a clay strainer or filter put in there to sort out some of the concoctions that the Caddo were preparing to drink, including um, Holly, they were using Holly to make the black drink. Uh, they were using Datura or Jimson weed, as well as peyote, mixing them together. And residues of Datura have been found on Caddo bottles. And it's only a matter of time before some of these other uh, hallucinogens are identified. Utility wares in the Texarkana phase are different, not much emphasis on neck banding or punctations. The vessel on the bottom, very short rim, long body with uh, brushing marks, probably grass that was put on like a paintbrush or something like that and dragged down the vessel while it was wet before it had been fired. Vessel in the top has incised lines of various kinds, including curved linear scrolls that do not meet, but have this little applique node in the center. Four of those, like all Caddo pottery. In historic Caddo times, much less diverse pottery is being made, probably because there are fewer Caddo people around at that time. European epidemic diseases had a terrible effect on the Caddo, but they were, uh, whoever was making this pottery was a master potter. Um, but you can see again the continuities that go from early to late Caddo with the scroll lines, tick marks, triangles, scrolls at the top, things like that. This is Natchitoches engraved probably continued to be made about until about maybe 1750. Similar pottery, but farther west. This is a different Caddo group making this pottery. It has, again, the scroll lines, the hooked arms, the tick lines, circles, cross hatch zones, all this kind of stuff on these carinated bowls. The historic Caddo pottery tends to have slightly inverted rims, as you can see on this pot, not standing vertically. Just one of those style things that starts about 1600 or so. They made these very distinctive bowls on the left that have lip notching and uh, the scroll lines that hook together. And then this bottle at the bottom also has a spool neck and it was originally just red slipped, but then the potter came in and scraped away areas in, in a scroll elements, leaving behind uh, this negative design with the red paint. And you can also see in some of the corners, uh, there was evidence that white paint had also been applied to this. Uh, it, this vessel is called Hatinu engraved, and it was named by the Caddo peoples it just means red engraved. La lastly, these, this particular vessel was collected in the 1850s from the Brazos Indian Reservation uh, that was established in 1854. Uh, the doctor that worked out there purchased this pot and brought it back and it's now in the Brooklyn Museum. But you can still get an idea there they have the stylistic elements in mind of which they preferred scrolls, triangles, hatch lines, you name it. The, uh, the last known traditional Caddo potter was making pottery as late as 1908. And 
subsequently the tradition was lost until just recently which i'll mention later okay moving out of the red river basin uh, basically have the east texas ceramic region that has these major streams in it uh, but very distinctive differences once we get out of the woodland and early Caddo period in terms of the style and craftsmanship. Example of another barrel shaped jar, woodland period, very thick walls, plain, probably dating in this case about to AD 300 or so. This comes from a site on the tributary of the Sabine River that was investigated a few years ago. Early Caddo pottery, the most distinctive innovation is, again, the engraved lines on vessels, either bottles or carinated bowls. One to the left, scroll lines, concentric lines, curved linear lines, and meeting in the middle with a little excised circle. More common is the vessel to the right that just has three horizontal engraved lines. These cattle bottles are distinctive for their very long necks. Utility wares, where these designs were applied before the vessel was fired. The one on the top left has a series of rim peaks and it was decorated with incise lines as well as a river cane that was cut up, cut and then pushed into the pottery. The vessel on the right has what are considered to be fingernail marks at the top along the rim and then uh, different kinds of fingernail marks going down the body. These are, if you were to find any shirt that had that big fingernail mark on it, you would know right away what it was. And these are early Caddo. Middle Caddo is very diverse. Each community seems to have made their own pottery in their own way with different uses of temper. Some groups preferred bone temper more than any others. Others stuck with grog temper or hematite uh, for temper, but the, it's the stylistic elements that are most characteristic. This middle caddo pot, as you can see, has an engraved rattlesnake motif on it. And this is not common, but is found at maybe 10 or 15 sites in East Texas, all dating to the middle Caddo period, which is AD 1200 to 1400. This particular vessel comes from a shaft tomb in a mound in the city of Nacogdoches. The mound is still there. It's across from the local high school. Other kinds of distinctive middle Caddo pottery here we have a different vessel shape. These are called compound bowls because they have two rim panels. And you can see at the top, up, upper right, they preferred uh, zones, curved linear, circular ladders and columns with crosshatch lines. That's a very distinctive middle caddo way of making things. The one to the left has semicircles, probably sun symbols, ovals, uh, scrolls with tick, tick marks, just a really diverse kinds of assemblages. Same way with their utility wear, which you can see it has distinctive four rim peaks. Again, the number four is crucial for the Caddo. It probably, it has four of these really big strap handles with incised, punctated and brushed designs on them and then the vessel body has been brushed and punctated and then divided into panels by vertical applique fillets where they just press down with their finger on them to hold the applique. Okay, now we can move into the late Caddo period in East Texas and most of what I'll be talking about is either Titus phase or Frankston and Allen phase. The Titus phase is found in the Sabine and Big Cypress drainages, while the Frankston and Allen phases are found 
in the Nietzsche's and Angelina basins. And these, these were contemporaneous Caddo groups, not just one group, but probably a dozen within each phase. But they their pottery is very different, very distinctive. The other phases, the Angelina and Salt Lick, are much less well known. As an example of how distinctive this pottery is, we have recognized a number of distinctive varieties of particular types. So in the upper right are a number of varieties for Ripley engraved. And you can see uh, scroll lines are very important to almost every element in there, usually with a central element, including the circles, sun circles, other kinds of things. Going to the left, these are the main elements in pointer engraved, which go with the Frankston phase. And there is not a scroll to be seen in these. these they prefer rectangular areas and oval areas, sometimes with you know, little circles in the middle um, or divided by what I call brackets in the case of uh, H to the bottom. And you can see there are examples where they did decorate the body, the body of the vessel with these curved, linear, concentric, semi circles and scrolls with hooked arms. Moving over to the Allen phase, to, to the bottom right, which comes out of the Frankston phase and dates after 1680, very similar uh, with patent engraved to the semicircular hooked arm elements but they all have tick marks on uh, the lines and that's how we distinguish them. Another pottery, and you'll see the vessel form, but it's a very distinctive elongated bottle and that's E, F, and G. And that's a human grave where you had these long crosshatch lines that extended most of the way down the vessel. The rim on a few of them will have hatched triangles and gets back again to the use of these triangle elements by the Caddo. Here are some examples of the Titus phase fine wear. You can recognize the upper right, that's has a scroll line with a central circle. That's probably a their version of a peyote button in the center. To the left is a Taylor engraved carinated bowl with the red slip and scroll lines and hooked arms that meet in this instance. The bottom right is a distinctive compound bowl, red slipped with engraved triangles and scroll lines. And you can see some patches of a white kaolin clay pigment that was put in the engraved lines, rubbed into it. These Titus face folks made bottles and oyas of various kinds. The upper left has a what to me looks like a, an upside down duck head, though some archaeologists think it's a turkey, but it, it uh, is analogous to these others in terms of having elements that hook around each other but don't meet. The one to the right, there the elements hook around each other and meet at an excised circle. The one on the bottom just has in gray, gray panels, and that's the Oya. Uh, those are not, those are common in some parts of East Texas, but not all. Utility wear cooking jars, ranging from very elaborate, as in the upper example, with brushed, punctated, applique chevron elements, to very simple at the bottom, with a few punctated lines and some small applique nodes. Moving to the Frankston phase, here the, the vessel on the bottom is one of these elongated bottles I mentioned previously. Uh, what it has been pinched for decoration where the potter took uh, the, the clay in their hands and pinched it with two fingers to make these rows of what I think looks like a corn cob. At the upper left is common utility wear jar that often will have incised lines 
on the rim, cross hatched, or a number of other elements, and brushing, punctation, applique, all kinds of combinations on the body. The upper right is the classic Frankston Bay's fine wear called pointer engraved. You can see big uh, parentheses or brackets filled with crosshatch lines. Note also that the vessel is indented, um, inverted at the rim, unlike the Titus Bay's body. So this is probably a fairly late example, maybe AD 1600 or so of fine wares in that area. Another example of a fine wear in Frankston phase and Allen phase are these effigy bowls. And they'll usually have a turkey head at the front and then a tail rider at the back. And with some kind of, uh, in most cases, an animal, but sometimes a human figure will be there. That might be a bear or a dog, hard to say. To the right is the classic historic Caddo pottery for East Texas called Patton Engraved. Um, it has the lines that hook around each other, but you'll notice uh, the outer lines of the engraving has tick marks, tick marks on the rim and toward the bottom of the, of the rim. Uh, some of the later examples of patent engraved also are brushed on the body like this example. Not really sure why they did that other than it might've made it easier to pick up. Lastly, uh, after about 1720 or so in East Texas, pottery is less diverse. Uh, there's more uniform uh, manufacture and decoration of vessels. Uh, we had talked about Natchitoches engraved along the Red River. Here's another example, virtually the same from East Texas from a Nadako Caddo site dated about 1780. And at the bottom is a Sims engraved vessel, which we also talked about on the Red River from that same site. A little bit different, but still emphasizing horizontal and vertical scroll lines and tick marks. And with the inverted carinated bowl form. And before I leave you, I just want to uh, bring Caddo studies up to date in that even though the last traditional Caddo pottery was making pottery in 1908. And then after that, Caddo forgot that they made pottery. They really had no idea until they came to a Texas Archaeological Society field school in 1991. And we took them to the Museum of the Red River in Idabel, which has a lot of ancestral Caddo pottery. And when they saw this, they were just amazed. They had no idea that the Caddo made pottery and it was so beautiful and so, you know, so well made. And so one of the women who was there, Jerry Redcorn, decided that she would teach herself how to make her own pottery. She got limited instructions from a couple of archeologists, looked at the handbook of Texas to see vessel forms and shapes, and then launched her own manufacture. And this is an example of one of the vessels she made uh, used to be in my collect personal collection because she was always a great attraction at the cattle conference because she would bring pottery vessels that every archeologist wanted to have. And uh, subsequently I've donated this to permanent curation at Texas Archeological Research Lab. But she is still continues to make pottery. One of her engraved vessels was picked by Michelle Obama to sit in the Oval Office and it was there during Obama's uh, whole second term. And subsequently her nephew Chase Earls has started to make Caddo pottery and uh, it's pretty incredible when you look at what they produced then and compared to what they produced back in archaeological time that Caddo pottery was really the apex of Native American pottery in Eastern North America. The only thing that compares in terms of quality and skill and artistry are the pottery that's made in the Southwest. 
So I hope more Caddo people will continue uh, to learn how to make Caddo pottery and that they'll share that with us because archaeologists can learn a lot from how the Caddo are making pottery today. Uh, thank you. Tim, I want to thank you for sharing your knowledge of Caddo ceramics with us today. Uh, I'm truly impressed by the variation in uh, vessel form and design among Caddo ceramics across space and time. And I really think that I came across in your presentation today. So uh, once again, thank you. Sure. Glad to do it. For anyone uh, watching this video who may have questions for Tim about Caddo Ceramics, uh, please feel free to place your, uh, your questions in the comments below. So thanks for watching.